Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Well, James DeGale delivered. Hopefully, it's more bare for us, right? Hopefully, there's more money in your account today than there was before the fight, especially given that some books had Durrell as the favorite. Now, let me just say this, and I'm serious. When it comes to gambling, I'm not the person who, you know, rubs his nose and then thinks, oh, man, I've jinxed my fighter, or I've jinxed the team I'm rooting on, right? I'm not the person who you know, touches his hair and then thinks, oh man, I changed my position. Now my guy is going to lose four or five rounds. I'm not that guy. But I do believe in karma, right? If you're a gambler, I believe you understand what goes around comes around. That the person who's down on their luck today might actually be the helping hand tomorrow. Right? The person who's down on their luck today might actually be you. So, if you made a windfall on this fight and you're watching this video right now in an internet cafe, and you're being served by a waitress or a waiter who you sense is serving three or four other tables but is keeping the smile on their face, is keeping your coffee hot, is keeping your situation comfortable, and is doing it all with a smile on their face, then I hope you leave them a decent tip, right? If you're in a bar and you're noticing the bartender behind the bar is dealing with a full bar, is hustling, but yet he still has the presence of mind to come by where you are and remind you that happy hour is about to end and that if you want to get cheap drinks, you need to buy them in the next five minutes. I hope you leave them a tip. That neighbor who you know is quietly picking up trash on the sidewalk, even when that sidewalk's in front of your house, I hope you think about taking that person to a movie. Right? Use the opportunity. Use windfalls you get gambling to help yourself, but also to help other people. You'll be surprised how small the world is. You'll be surprised how, when you're down, People are there helping you out. Now let's talk about this fight. First, let's remove some folklore. People with agendas are trying to convince you that the scoring on this fight was iffy, right? Guys like Carl Frotch are trying to say, hey, you know, on my scorecard, this fight was awfully close, right? Carl Frotch, who didn't drop Andre Durrell once, Right, who just saw a fight where Andre Durrell gets dropped twice, wants you to believe that, oh, this fight came down to the last round. I watched it on PBC, NBC here in the United States. I understand those guys were trying to conjure up a bunch of excitement. Let me say, too, BJ Flores is a breath of fresh air on NBC. Right, He does a great job as an analyst. I thought the beginning where Flores is facing... Anthony Durrell, Andre's brother, and Flores then shows you what James DeGale could do to win was five star. I thought that was outstanding stuff. I thought he was dead on. But let me just say this. I know NBC wanted you to believe that this fight hung in the balance late, right? And let me say this. I understand two of the three judges had the fight 114-112. Okay, fair enough. Let's talk about just the fight in a snapshot. Let's be real for a second. Let me look at some notes here, right? It's that complicated. The first half of the fight, right? In my opinion, Durrell comes out, looks great in the first round. He wins the first round, no question about it. Now understand, the second round is clearly a 10-7. DeGale knocks him down twice. They're bad knockdowns. Right? The first knockdown, Durrell goes straight back, doesn't know what hit him. Right? 
The second knockdown, I know guys like Carl Frotch are calling it a push. The bottom line is Durrell has a poker face, right? Durrell's face always looks the same. He's in trouble, folks. His face literally falls into, you know, uh, the thigh area of the gale, right? The gale then moves aside and he falls to the floor. If that's not a knockdown, I don't know what is. That second round's 10-7. The third round is a strong DeGale round as well, but we'll call it 10-9. I'll give the fourth round to Durrell. I'll give the fifth and sixth rounds to DeGale. Now understand, first six rounds, just on rounds, forget the knockdowns, just on rounds, the Gale wins four of the first six, just on rounds. Now, when you factor in the 10-7, when you add two more points to the DeGale column, he's up by four rounds at the end of six. Right? Understand, it's a four-round gap at the end of six. Now, can we all agree that the Gale wins the 11th and 12th rounds right now let me say this I know the Daily Mail I've read a bit on this fight I know the Daily Mail in the UK has the 11th round a 10-10 round you know what on my scorecard the Gale wins the 11th round then the Gale comes out and wins the 12th round so just understand right James the Gale runs out the clock on Andre Durrell, right? Durrell ends the first half of the fight down by four rounds, four, right? Then he's unable to make up the four rounds because he only outscores, if you believe, the 114-112 narrative. He only outscores the Gale by two rounds, in the remaining six, right? It's 4-2, right? So just understand, the Gale wins this fight. There should be no question about it. Rather than talk about the fight as being close, people should be referring to this fight as the unanimous decision that it is, unanimous. None of the judges took Durrell in this fight. Now I know Post Mayweather Pacquiao, it's fashionable for fighters to say, hey, I won the fight even when they lost. Come on now. Right? I know Andre Durrell is saying, hey, all the Gale did was run. Andre, did you forget the part where he knocked you down twice? Right? Let's be real here. Right? How's a guy just running if he knocks you down twice? Now let's let's talk about the fight here. Let's frame it. And let me uh, let me just say too that this is that rare time where I actually disagree with two of the three judges. I'm more in line with the third judge. Right? Understand. And tell me how you score fights. Let's have a dialogue here. This isn't all about me. There's a comment section to this video. Let's talk with each other. If I'm watching a fight and the other guy, right, has timed his opponent to the point where he can drop his hands, right? The Gale has his hands so low that analyst Sugar Ray Leonard was startled, right? Leonard at one point late in the fight said, hey, you know, I'd be, think about this, Ray Leonard, the combination puncher. Right? The guy who would open up with both hands. Right? Ray Leonard, the guy who fought Marvin Hagler after three years outside of the ring. That Ray Leonard, the gambler, the guy who turns into a puncher against Thomas Hearns. Ray Leonard on the telecast actually says that he would be more conservative than James DeGale with the placement of his hands. Right? He's the one who uses the words more conservative. Right? Then he says his hand should be higher. 
Now think about it. You have the Gale facing a fast-handed Andre Durrell. Fast-handed. The Gale has his hands down at his side, folks. I want you to revisit round seven, eight, nine, and ten. Let's look at those four rounds. The Gale has Durrell time to the point where the Gale's not worried about getting hit. This is as he outmaneuvers Andre Durrell. He's literally putting on a class. Right? This this is an exhibition of spectacular spacing and footwork. It's spectacular. Now, tell me how you score this. Two guys go over to the side of the ring. One guy throws a lot of punches, which Andre Durrell does at times. The other guy has them all blocked. Puts his hands up, the punches are landing here. You watch the scene enough and you realize the guy who's blocking the punches has his opponent exactly where he wants him. Right? If people revisit the 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th rounds, if you're in the footwork, if you're the kind of person who believes that the first round of the first Ali Liston fight, a round where Ali hardly throws any punches, he's just showing footwork, he's showing Liston a 7-1 to one favorite, that he can't hit him. If you believe that round's a masterpiece, one of Ali's best, if you, like me, Watch the Pernell Whitaker Oscar De La Hoya fight. And still can't quite figure out how the judges gave that fight to Oscar. Watch Pernell Whitaker in some rounds where Whitaker hardly throws any punches. Embarrass Oscar De La Hoya. Right? Walk him into places around the ring where Oscar couldn't hit him. Right? Google Oscar's comments on Pernell Whitaker. Within the last three years, Oscar gave an interview where he talks about Whitaker as being the best defensive fighter he ever fought. If you believe that, uh, that boxing has offense, but also has defense, that the guy who's able to drop his hands against a fast-handed opponent, right, Use the entire ring, what Ray Leonard in the sixth round calls ring generalship, is going around the ring, picking spots, is in and out, and he isn't getting rained on. He's dry, right? The other guy with hand speed can't hit him, right? Understand the compu box numbers. Right? Or in Durrell's favor. Look at the connect percentage. Right? Neither fighter throws appreciably more punches than the other. Now, how is that possible if, when you're looking at the 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th rounds, Durrell, who knows he's behind because his back's been on the canvas twice, is trying to push the action? Why isn't he landing? Before this fight, did you really think that James DeGale had great legs? That you were dealing with an Ali? How's DeGale walking around the ring and not getting hit with hard shots? Now, if you're someone who, like me, believes in ring generalship, you were laughing in the 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th rounds. I'm not saying DeGale won all of those rounds. I'm not saying that at all, but the skill level was obvious. In other words, just think it through. Let's frame the fighters. Andre Durrell, right, is a big man for super middle. Look at his height. He's over six feet tall. He's a great athlete. He has hand speed. He has a superior hand speed here between the two guys. He has the much better jab. In fact, he has one of the best jabs, he calls it a stick, in the sport of boxing. 
Now, how does a tall guy with a great jab and superior hand speed not land punches? Think about it. It's because he's fighting a guy who is dealing on spacing and timing. James DeGale knows that there are times when he can be right in front of Andre Durrell and Durrell can't hit him. Think about it. You've seen Andre Durrell fights where he's bludgeoning the other guy with that jab. Why was the jab a non-factor in this fight? Why does James DeGale, and I'll agree, DeGale gets an eye busted up. I'll agree on that. But why is DeGale's head not snapping back? Why is the jab a non-factor in round 7, 8, 9, and 10? Right? The reason, simply put, is boxing mastery. Now, Pernell Whitaker got a draw in a fight he won by a few rounds. The first, in fact, the only time he fought Julio Cesar Chavez. Whitaker curiously lost the Oscar De La Hoya fight on the judges' scorecards. It was so curious, Whitaker took out an ad the next day in the Los Angeles Times, Oscar's local newspaper, saying, Oscar, you and I both know I won that fight. Now, I'll agree. Fans want offense. I'll agree. The Gale's energy in round 7, 8, 9, and 10 is negative energy. I don't believe the Gale's tired. Some of you have left comments on the pre-fight video saying the Gale was winded. The Gale was gassed. I don't believe the Gale was gassed. The Gale's putting on a show. He's in front of a jabber who can't land his jab. He's in front of a guy who needs to land big punches to win the fight. And the guy can't land the power punches. Look at the CompuBox on the power punches. How is it that the Gale, who's landing a higher percentage of all punches, is landing far more power punches in this fight than Andre Durrell? So, I understand BJ Flores, Steve Farhood, on NBC, both had Andre Durrell winning round six, round seven, round eight. Now it's curious because Ray Leonard at the time on the same telecast in the sixth round tells you how he's impressed with Durrell's ring generalship. Right? Boxing's a sport where we're going to disagree on some things. Let's just say I never thought there was a moment in this fight where James Durrell, uh, James DeGale wasn't where he wanted to be. When they're up on the ropes, let me tell you, Andre Durrell is so concerned about James DeGale's inside game that he literally just pushes DeGale onto the side of the ropes, doesn't throw punches, just pushes him and just stays there. Now you had a master boxer. I would say this guy's a better boxer than Andre Durrell in Andre's corner. And that's former heavyweight champion Chris Bird. Now understand, Chris Bird had no business fighting at heavyweight. Chris Bird's history was in lighter weight classes. But Chris Bird, who was a technician's technician, Right, saw the paychecks being handed out for heavyweight matches and decided, hey, even though I'm not a heavyweight, I'll gain weight. I'll fight at heavyweight. You might recall Chris Bird was the opponent who was fighting Vitaly Klitschko and Vitaly Klitschko tore out his shoulder. Right, Chris Bird won that match. Now, during this match, there's a great moment. They have Danny Jacobs, that's right, the middleweight champion, in the corner of Andre Durrell. Chris Bird is a part of his corner. Chris Bird tells Danny Jacobs that what he wants is for Andre Durrell to stay in the pocket. 
So as James DeGale backs away from the pocket, Durrell can hit him. My argument to you here in this video is that few guys in the sport have that skill set. Right? You're going to stay in the pocket against James DeGale? Good luck with that. Where did that get Marco Antonio Parabin? Hell, where did that get Andre Durrell in the second round of this fight? Right? Understand, staying in the pocket, talk about easier said than done, means blocking shots, means dealing with what Adam Booth calls James DeGale's blender. Understand, DeGale's one loss is George Groves on his back foot. Right? That's his one loss. So understand, Andre Durrell is very good, right? Andre Durrell is one of the best fighters in boxing without a title. He's very good at mid-range. He actually is very good at long range because that jab's a problem for most people. He doesn't have to get too close to you. He's not great. He's certainly not James DeGale at short range. Now, Chris Bird you know, wanted Durrell to survive at short range and then to time it to hit the Gale on the way out. Now, I'll agree. The Gale's open at times on the way out. Right? He even gets hit a few times on the way out as he's backing up after an onslaught. He has a routine where if he gets hit on the way out, he acts like the shot didn't bother him, he immediately tries to come back. Right? I'll agree. DeGale can be hit on the way out. Right? He's not a perfect fighter. But just understand, who's going to survive in the pocket against James DeGale? Right? James DeGale wasn't fighting Floyd Mayweather Jr. here. He was fighting Andre Durrell. Right? Durrell's an athlete who likes to extend his arms a bit. Right? James DeGale wasn't fighting Chris Bird here. He was fighting Chris Bird's protege. Big difference. Right? So let me close by saying this. Listen to Ray Leonard's comments in the sixth round. Right? And let's just say Ray Leonard had great legs. Listen to Ray Leonard talk about James DeGale's patience and his ability to use the entire ring. Understand, James DeGale puts on a footwork exhibition in the second half of this fight. Right? Understand, he never hits the canvas. He neutralizes Andre Durrell's jab. Right? He does it in a way that's so thorough that it looks like he's just boxing as usual. Right? Understand how frustrated Durrell was. Right? Durrell starts yelling at him. Durrell starts cursing at him. Because Durrell can't get him to engage. What I want you to do is to look at the CompuBox numbers. If Durrell's pushing the action that much, how come his punch numbers aren't better? That's the tip-off. That he's fighting a great defensive fighter. Now, I'll agree. I'm with Ray Leonard. In that Durrell's, excuse me, DeGale's hands are so low at times. As someone who bet on DeGale, I was nervous. Right? He drops his hands. But understand the flip side of that analysis. He's able to drop his hands against Andre Durrell. When have you seen that, folks? Right? He's fighting a fighter who's one of the best in boxing without a title. What happens when DeGale fights a guy who doesn't have Andre Durrell's jab? Who doesn't have Andre Durrell's hand speed? who doesn't have Andre Durrell's reach, what's going to happen then? Right? So, masterful performance by James DeGale.
I think he's just getting started. Let me break ranks with Martin Murray, who believes that Janady Golovkin beats DeGale and Carl Froch. Right? Let me say this. While I might take Golovkin against Carl Froch, right? Let's just say there is no way I would take him against James DeGale. Understand the skill level here. I personally believe that James DeGale fighting at 168 today can beat Adonis Stevenson, the light heavyweight champion. DeGale in the post-fight interview talked about wanting to make history, right? He already is the first UK Olympic gold medalist to become a world champion. He's talking about unifying the belts. What I hope that the Gale people do is to set their sights a little bit higher than that. Right? He really needs to look at the light heavyweight division and ask himself, who would give me a hard time in that division? Now, I'll agree. I believe the person at light heavyweight who would give him the hardest time would be Sergei Kovalev, right? But let's just say I wouldn't hesitate to take him over Arthur Baturbioff, right? At 168, I wouldn't hesitate to take the Gale over Badu Jack, right? Let's just say Janady Golovkin will have a few decisions to make, right? I personally believe Golovkin does better against taller fighters and shorter fighters, but I also believe that James the Gale knows how to fight small better than most there's a zone there short range inside where I believe James DeGale would have a distinct advantage on Janady Golovkin so I want people to realize that James DeGale is a serious talent he's so serious that guys in retirement like Carl Froch feel a need to try to question this win a win, quite frankly, that's far more convincing than Froch's win over the same opponent. Right? Understand, a lot of people have a lot of strong feelings about James DeGale. Understand DeGale isn't the most friendly persona. Right? In his country, in the United Kingdom, this gold medal winner was not the person the fans were cheering for in the later rounds against George Groves. Right? So, DeGale isn't the most loved fighter in the world. He certainly is one of the very best. Right? Keep an eye on this guy and please remember to tip your waitress, tip your waiter, thank your bartender, and thank your neighbor. Thanks for stopping by. I'm very grateful.